What makes a great game? Is it a compelling story? Great character dynamics? Maybe it's fantastic gameplay, or just an experience you've never felt anywhere else. What if I told you that this game already exists, and yet, it's handled by one of the most hated companies in all of gaming? Sounds crazy, right? Well, sometimes, the crazy becomes reality and you're left with something amazing. Or, like, a serial killer. Hmm, <laughs> not my best comparison. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before we begin, though, we're gonna need to go back to a time to when things were just getting started. The year is 2007, and the first-person shooter genre is one that has been established for quite a while now. Generally, these games are focused towards an audience that wants to flex their mechanical skills. Maybe you want to let some steam off after work, or work with a team to work towards a single goal. Winning. The shooters we had leading into 2007 were good, but what we were about to receive would blow all of that out of the water. Bioshock, Halo 3, and Team Fortress 2 had just been released and they were hot, 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 offering a variety of shooting playstyles. Each of them were a bit slower paced, favoring a more strategic approach to combat. Something needed to break the mold to give gamers a quicker experience in a new, faster paced setting. Most of the popular games of today host a range of tools that allow you to get around the maps quickly to dispatch your foes. But in 2007, this was more of an oddity. This, however, was about to change in the newest iteration of a well-known game franchise that up to this point had only specialized in historical titles. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. Call of Duty, or COD for short, had its legs deeply rooted in World War II for its first three titles and decided that in their new outing, it was time to move on to something a bit more... modern. <laughs> get it? COD 4 presented many different things that separated it from the pack. It had a gripping and pulse-pounding campaign experience chock full of exciting and memorable moments. Within it, there were also a plethora of memorable quotes, such as... Your fruit killing skills are remarkable. Switching to your pistol is always faster than reload. What the hell kind of name is soap, eh? We are the game provided a fast-paced, state-of-the-art shooting frame with high-quality graphics that in 2007 was exactly what the scene was missing. The multiplayer was a varied, action-packed experience that was wildly popular to the community. I myself would sink hours into this game every single summer night up until the point where my Xbox gave out completely. On top of that, the community was amazing. Okay, maybe not so much. But these were clearly developers that loved the time they had spent making this product, and it showed. It may have felt at the time like a one-hit wonder, but for the folks over at Infinity Ward, this was only the beginning. The next iteration of the franchise came two years later in the form of Modern Warfare 2. No, not that one. This one. Damn these copy and paste names. Modern Warfare 2 dropped to the bang, and this time came with many improvements from where COD 4 had left off. We had even better graphics, a fresh UI, and a new campaign full of many more iconic moments and memorable quotes. History is written by the victor. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Remember, no Russian. Then you slide on over to the multiplayer, which had managed to add a plethora of cool new features. They added more gun customization, adding a variety of new kill streaks, and yet again, increasing the speed of the game even more. Mod 2 had moved in a fantastic direction, but soon after its release, relations soured between two of the higher-ups within Infinity Ward and their publisher, Activision, and the pair was subsequently fired. Not willing to rest on their laurels, however, the duo partnered up again and combined the creative prowess to found a brand new studio, and thus, Respawn Entertainment was born. Following their departure, many of their former Infinity Ward employees had also jumped ship with them to join Respawn Entertainment in an effort to create more games similar to how their Call of Duty titles had felt. But making a new studio of this size right out of the gate with no backlog of other games to fund yourself with is expensive, so the company sought to acquire funding through Electronic Arts. Whether it be their rushed low-quality game releases, poor treatment of their employees, or oversaturation in the usage of loot boxes, EA doesn't have a great reputation. Regardless of that fact, though, they had money, and Respawn didn't. So it ended up being an offer they just couldn't refuse. After things were sorted out, Respawn jumped right into the development of their first title. The idea was to create a shooter so amazing that it could take down the titans of the industry like Battlefield and COD by revolutionizing the FPS genre. And in the dawn of 2014, quickly following the release of the 8th generation of consoles, Titanfall was delivered to the front. Titanfall was one of the first games at the time that didn't try to cater their release to both the current and previous gen consoles. In doing so, it was able to really push the technology forward by utilizing the power that these new devices held. We saw maps littered with AI soldiers, a multitude of towering powerhouse mechs, and a smattering of all sorts of particle effects at every frame. The game had implemented an intricate parkour system, combining wall running, double jumping, and wall hanging. 
The weapon options were very bare bones in this game, but each had a specific role that they fit into. The weapons were ranged from shotgun to sniper, and each one felt like they were designed to shoot slightly further than the last. The maps were designed to encourage verticality, with multiple floors on each building, and lanes wide enough for you to maneuver through with the Titans. Speaking of which, the Titans themselves had three chassis to pick from, but few weapons to decide between. The game felt very unique, but unfinished. There was no single player campaign to speak of, and for a game that is multiplayer exclusive, $60 was quite a high asking price. The multiplayer campaign, while fun, just didn't fill the same hole that an actual connected single player storyline would have, especially since its progression through the levels would be the same regardless of which team won. They tried to remedy the situation by adding a horde-like game mode called Frontier Defense to the game later down the road, but it was bare bones and arrived too late to make any real impact. The community enjoyed the game while they could, but were only able to take so much of this limited product before boredom set in. So is this it? Was there really nothing else? Is this all that the hyped up Respawn Entertainment had to offer? No. Two years after the original title, Titanfall 2 was released. This was it. This was finally the game we'd been waiting for. Respawn had taken what had worked well with COD and combined it with the world and environments of Titanfall, and we were blessed with this beauty. They had learned their lessons from the previous game and iterated on the parkour system to craft something even better. A slide mechanic was added, which allowed you to keep your momentum up on and off walls, allowing you to maintain high speeds no matter where you went. Combine that with the new stim or grapple gadgets, and you could damn near create a sonic boom as you crossed an entire map in mere seconds. A second large but controversial change that they made was to limit the Titans to specific loadouts on fixed chassis with only minor adjustments that could be made by players. Although this sounded like a major downgrade at first, this was the exact change needed to push the game forward into something that was much cleaner and more organized. Previously when you saw a Titan, you had no idea what weapon it could be using until it was too late. Now when you saw one of their unique chassis moving around a corner, you knew exactly what they could do and planned your counterplay accordingly. The seven different titans each fit into specific roles that if played properly would excel in whatever they were good at without feeling like they were stepping on each other's toes. Except for you, Scorch. You kind of sucked. Sorry, not sorry. The main game mode that really benefited from these changes was Last Titan Standing, which for those of you who don't know, is a 5-5 game mode where each player starts in a titan, and whichever team manages to destroy the other team's titans first wins the round. The game then continues until one team reaches four wins and is deemed the victor. You can coordinate with your allies as to what the overall strategy is going to be, and then assemble a team composition that helps to perfectly execute that plan. Did your idea not play out so well, and they broke through one of the sides to overwhelm you? No problem, just switch around a couple of the players or titans and win the next round. Another cool aspect of this game mode was that even if you lost your titan, you weren't immediately out of the game. You can still run around and shoot enemy titans or collect batteries that were used to heal and shield allied titans in order to help you win the round. In fact, some of the anti-Titan weapons were so good that you could completely forgo your Titan altogether and probably still win the round because of complete and utter nonsense. It was a fantastic and underrated game mode and more people needed to play it. <sighs> Sorry, I got a bit sidetracked there. Where were we? <clears throat> the addition of Frontier Defense in this game didn't feel late like in the first game, and in this go of it, they added special augments that you would unlock with each Titan that allowed you to really lean into their strengths in the battlefield. The Ronin could maintain high shields while hitting Titans. The Ion could sustain their ultimate as long as you kept killing more Titans. And my boy Scorch went from being zero to hero and was the best Titan in this game mode by a mile. Things were looking amazing. No matter which way you looked, you'd always find something exciting to be drawn into. And I haven't even mentioned yet the single biggest improvement over the first game. I hope I can live up to the honor. This campaign is so fun. It doesn't have super in-depth characters that interact in complicated ways. It doesn't have skill trees that you can customize as you advance through the plot. It's just... fun. And that's all it needs to be. In the story, you follow Jack Cooper as he's thrown into the role of pilot after his colleague's death and has to find a way to stop the IMC. The story was a pretty straightforward good versus evil plot, but none of that mattered because what they did deliver was pure spectacle. Each level offered a distinct experience that required you to think a little differently each time around. Whether it's bushwhacking through a jungle in search of batteries, Escaping a factory as it constructs buildings on top of you, or sifting through radiation as you power up a facility with your Tesla gun, the game never fails to keep things interesting. On top of that, you have a plethora of boss fights throughout the game that force you to use all the skills that you've acquired up to this point in order to fight for your life. But the Titanfall 2 campaign really comes to a climax around the midpoint of the story in a mission where you have to travel between two parallel timelines in order to navigate the landscape in an effort to discover the IMC's grand plans. This mission was a masterpiece, and it's always the first thing I think about when I remember the good times I had with this game. What a gem. However strong all these elements were, the game was plagued with too many external issues resulting in its early swan song. The previous title being so underwhelming turned away many potential customers from even considering buying the sequel. 
and the scar of it being a video game produced by EA damaged its reputation into being seen as just another quick cash grab. The largest detractor, however, was derived from its poor release schedule. Titanfall 2 was released on October 28th of 2016, one week after Battlefield 1 and one week prior to Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, which left any gamers with limited budget to decide on whichever game they were most familiar with, and as the black sheep in this relationship, Titanfall 2 was left on the shelf. This quickly led to the game having a small and fast hemorrhaging community that was all but gone within a year, leaving Titanfall 2 to be lost to the ether. What a shame. Luckily, however, for Respawn, this was not the end. Regardless of whether or not it had received enough playtime, Titanfall 2 had allowed them to create a fantastic shooting frame from which they could adjust even further, and three years later, in February of 2019, they dropped Apex Legends, which simplified the formula by removing Titans and the double jump in favor of a class-based battle royale experience that continues to be massively popular to this day. Even in its dead state, Titanfall 2 was still pushing the FPS genre forward. And for those of us that were able to be part of this ride, I just wanted to say, thanks. You will always live on in our memories as legendary.